<laughs> uh, we're going to talk about the Arduino microcontroller hardware today. And uh, we'll start with, for those of you, I think I know most of you, but for, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Forrest, WH1ZG. I've been a ham for about 50 years. Um, there's one ground rule tonight. Please ask a question when the slide is up. <laughs> Not 10 slides later, because I'll forget what, what we were talking about. Okay, here's a buyer beware comment to start things out with. I purchased these, there's actually three connectors there. I purchased these three connectors from Adafruit, and they didn't last 10 insertion removal cycles. They, um, it appears that they're made by, you press everything together, so when you pull, you press pull them all apart. So spend the, so spend the money and buy a decent connector. These were 95 cents, I thought, great deal, and I bought a whole bunch of them. <laughs> and there's three of them right there. Okay. The big question I have when I sit out there is, why is this guy doing a presentation? So I'm an electronics engineer. I've been designing and developing hardware for soft. Don't mind if I read, because I can't remember all this stuff. Um, I've been designing and developing hardware and software for micro microcontroller-based products since 1980. Um, the first product, which is the terminal here on the left, um, was in assembly language for the RCA CDP-1802 microcontroller. <laughs> Somebody knows what that is. At the time, it was the only CMOS microcontroller available. And I won't go into the horror stories about their development system. My next project, also using the same processor, was one of the first battery-powered printers. And that was pretty cool because that was aluminized paper. So what they did is they burned the dots into the paper. They're little sparks when you tried to print characters. It was great light show in the dark. The last two projects, I'm sorry, what? Oh, that's too. right, Jamie worked on that too. He was my co-op. <laughs> and the last two projects on the, on the right were around 2014. Uh, the remote light controller was a pretty cool project. And the beer tap was a really cool project. That's an electronic beer tap. It'll pour a beer in three seconds, and you can control how much foam is put on top of the beer. <laughs> so, and there's, there's a real interesting, I'll take one second there, one second, one minute to walk back. They sold, mostly sold these in Europe. For some reason, the American stadiums don't like it. So they outfitted a soccer stadium in, I believe it was Belgium. <clears throat> they ran out of beer in, before the halftime. They brought in more beer and they ran out of beer before the end of the meet, or end of the game, because they could pour the beer so fast. They could pour the beer faster than they can make change. Wow. <laughs> so that, that was a real cool product. And, uh, and all of those, I did the electronic design and the software. And on the beer tap, I also did uh, QA? the internet, <laughs> internet <laughs> QA. <yeah. laughs> the, the, uh, network interface and it had um, an IR interface so you could walk up to it with your PDA and get the amount of beer you poured or whatever else needed to be looked at. Oh, that's enough of that. Okay, so we're going to take a couple minutes and look at other microcontroller boards. On the left is the Beagle board, black, and then the Pi is in the center and then an ASUS computer in, on the right side. And the only time I ever heard about the ASUS computer was somebody wrote an article in QST saying it was better for running FT8 than the Pi was. And the Pi is a dog running FT8. If you've got more than two or three um, stations being decoded, you can't do anything yet. You're just sitting waiting and waiting. The Beagle Bone Black, on the other hand, is a really fast board. I used it in one of my uh, projects for a company I was working for. Or, yes, sir. I was just wondering if that, was a, that comparison was using Raspberry Pi 3 or the 4? 3. three. <laughs> I think it was a 3. Because the 4 just came out. And the Beagle board, I think, is still faster than the Pi 4, but I'm not sure. And then here's more 
Arduino, well, here's two for Arduino comparisons. The one on the right is the Nano, and the three on the left are from um, Tweeny. I can't recall what the name of the company that makes them are. But the point, I, the reason I put them up there is they're about the same size, and from the chart, you can see the speed difference, where the Nano is only running at 16 megahertz. The slowest one up there is running at 72 megahertz. Um, so the, the Arduino is not the uh, end word, and here's, here's a great microprocessor, or a microcontroller board. There's a lot of good boards out there, is the point I'm trying to make. And I have to be careful. The first time I did a talk on microcontroller hardware, was 19, like 76, something like that. For, I think there was a Rochester Microcontroller Society. And I was talking about a microcontroller that there was just nothing I could think of that was any good to say about it. So I will try to be upbeat on this. So that's, there's some, um, there's competition for the Arduino. Of course, are the Arduino products in that category cheaper? Like, since you're getting fraction of the speed off the top of your head? No? I, I don't know. Carl Heinz, do you know what the Tweeny? It depends. Uh, the, the Teensy 4.0 is 20 bucks. Oh, Teensy, not Tweeny. The Arduino Nano, if you buy it from the Arduino people, it's probably about the same price. Yeah. But if you get the cheap Chinese crap knockoff, uh, mm -hmm. you pay about three bucks for it. Yeah. So if you're buying the real thing, it sounds like they're compatible. Okay, so here's three of, I guess, what I consider the popular Arduino boards. The, the Uno is the bottom left, the Mega is the bottom right, the Nano is the top. And the Nano and the Uno are essentially the same. A uh, little bit of hardware difference, but it's the same microcontroller. And that's, that's an approximate size comparison, so you can see you're building a product or a project, the Nano, in my mind, is the right way to go. And like Carl Heinz was saying, there's um, knockoff products, but go back to the second slide, buyer beware. Um, I think Tim, Tim Barrett had a problem. He bought three. Three, two and, worked. Yeah, and only two worked. So. I think it was $14 for three. Yeah. So you, 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 know, you get what you pay for. And be careful when you're buying Arduino boards. The first six boards on, on the four down on the left and the top two in the center are all called Nano, but they're all different types of Nano, so you have to read very carefully to see which one you're buying. The one circled in red is the Nano you would, that's kind of a general purpose that everybody talks about that you see in the articles in QST and CQ and other places. And then there's just four other types of Arduino modules. <coughs> and then they have things called shields, which plug in. But they mostly plug into the bigger boards, not the Nano. They work with the Nano, but you have to wire them together, where the pinouts on these bigger boards match the Uno, and I believe they match the middle one. So they just, they just plug in and write the code type of thing. Is there a shield adapter? There may be, there's so much stuff out there. Stuff out there, thank you, yeah. better word. <laughs> um, yes, maybe. There's, there's lots of cool things, like, uh, I didn't get a picture of it. But for the, for the Nano, they have an adapter board that brings everything out to screw terminals. So if you don't have a breadboard, or you're doing something that doesn't fit in the little white breadboard strips, the screw terminals, that's a that's a great adapter board for building something. Okay, <coughs> so what is an Arduino good for? And somebody in the uh, academy session has already asked that question. So here, I brought you some of the stuff I've been playing with to take a look at. But you can see, you can, you know, it's like whatever you think of, just don't get carried away. It's not going to be, you're not going to make an SDR transceiver with it. Um, it just doesn't have the processing power, but you can make a Simon game. Anybody remember the Simon game? <laughs> a friend of mine did it. Yeah? 
did and he made it or yeah oh cool so in the end I think the important thing about what you can do with the Arduino is it's one of those things you can build a project for and then say I did that you know and feel good about it I'm sorry I keep looking that way I'm missing you guys over here um, so quick <coughs> so that that's that's all I got on other microcontrollers and on the Arduino range of boards and just a quick stop at building prototypes so you can see up here my example of it but these these breadboarding strips are, are pretty nice for uh, doing a quick assembly they do have problems like parts fall out of them they aren't really as you know like I, I put you see I've got a speaker on one and it uh, it pops out every once in a while. And you can see in the picture on the right, I put little wires on the speaker so it plug into the board. So I can breadboard everything, but it's not gonna be carried around the living room and play with it type of thing. But it's it's a cool method. Um, your quarter watt resistor, resistor leads, cut the leads off at the, at the body of the resistor and they make perfect jumpers. If you look in the bottom picture, you can barely see the jumper wires. That's just nothing more than those resistor leads. Or you can go the expensive route and buy um, the ones in the center, which have terminals, either male, they're, they're female, female, male, male, and male, female uh, assortments. <coughs> and the colored lines, let's see if I can use one of these wonderful tools on this thing. These red and green lines. They, they run across the strip, but they stop at this black line. So you've got a set of terminals over here that are connected, a set of terminals over here that are connected, and they're mirrored on top. And then you see the, the blue line, it stops in the center of the board. So you've got you know, five terminals connected on the top and five terminals connected on the bottom. Makes it nice, you can plug in an IC, you can plug in a nano like you see in the picture below, and still have ways to hook something up to the terminal. Okay, so projects. This is a direct conversion receiver with a nano, and all the nano done is, does is run the display and run the uh, direct digital synthesis chip, which is the VFO in this project. And if you go back four September's ago, I did a presentation here on that. <coughs> the next thing is this board uses uses an Uno, and it's the beginning of a sideband transceiver that I started and lost interest in. <laughs> so all it does is lights the display and you push the buttons and it actually does something on the display but it doesn't really do anything. And this is the code practice oscillator that I had in uh, the rag a couple months ago and that uses the mega and the reason the mega was selected was the drivers for the SD card take up too much memory for a Nuno, I mean yeah, a Nuno or a Nano. Um, when you try to when you try to compile it, it just says there's not enough room. And they give you an error message, so they're very nice. But anyways, that worked worked quite well. Okay, <coughs> so let's get started. To be fair, there's more relevant material than we can cover in one hour, and especially like a sidetrack. Um, we'll we'll start with an overview of the nano itself. We will investigate the more common and easy use features, which is the initialization, digital I.O. and analog I.O. And if we have enough time, we'll do a 10,000 foot view of some of the other features of the nano. Um, if you look at the Arduino website, and look at their um, reference material, they show you all these neat instructions, but they really only deal with digital I.O. and um, analog I.O. Most, they don't get into the other stuff. It's just way too complicated for them to write simple commands for. So here's a comparison of the three Arduino boards, um, just so you can see them, how much digital I.O. The Mega is by far the, the biggest in all of these categories. And I took these numbers from um, from the Arduino website, I believe. And I'm a little confused on why the digital I.O. between the two identical microprocessors is different, but that's not mine to question. Maybe they 
done something on their board. But you can see what you can see what's going on. Um, for those who, well, quick explanation of digital I/O. Digital I/O is nothing more than a logic level, whether it's an input or an output. You're going to put a one or a zero, a five volts or a zero, a high or a low, whatever you want to call your digital input. But it's not three and a half volts isn't going to work. Two and a half volts isn't going to work. Um, Although National did try to make tri-state logic back in the 70s. I don't know how that would have turned out, but I'm glad it didn't. <laughs> and you can see how much RAM they have. The, the Mega has lots of RAM. The Mega has lots of flash. So if you want to write a big program, there it is. But if you look at the clock speed, they're all the same, they're all the same speed, relatively slow. Here's a quick look at the block diagram of both of the processors. The, the Uno and the Nano used the 328 and the Mega uses the 2560. And you can see there's not only more memory, but the level of complexity has increased in, um, in what the processor has. But you'll notice in the center there's this AVR, say AVR, yeah, AVR CPU. That's what does all all the work, all the calculating, the comparisons, the running the program, all the rest of that stuff around there is some type of a peripheral or another. So here's the data sheet for, for the processor, not for the, the, uh, not for the Arduino board itself, but this is just the processor. This is the meat of the board. It's 294 pages long, which is 27,490 square inches of information. <laughs> if you ever want to have something to read while you're sitting in bed. Um, I don't know if I can bring it up, but anyways. That's it. Um, at some point, as you're, as you're getting into, getting used to the project and you're tired of doing the simple things with the, with the digital read and the digital write, and you say, well, it's got a counter. What can I do with the counter? You're going to have to read this. Because they aren't telling you in, in the Arduino website how to handle this. This is something you've got to learn. And uh, these, the people who write data sheets aren't uh, novelists. You can see it's written with, <laughs> with, tech, with the tech, technical person in, in mind. So you, you do a lot of head scratching until you figure out what they're trying to tell you. But, I've read many of these, and they used to be books when I read them, not just PDFs. So, anyways, it's it's got lots of information. It's very helpful, and if if you want to do more than just read input and output signals, you're going to have to dig into this. But it's it's worth it. So a quick look. Here's the uh, the, the CPU core on on the left, and that just shows you. Um, uh, the arithmetic logic unit and just some of the things that make up the core that execute the program, not the peripherals. So on the on the inside of the bl heavy black line is the is the CPU core, and on the outside of the black <coughs> line shows all the external peripherals. So back in 19 what did I say 78 79 when I did that uh, handheld terminal. None of these stuff on the right side was was there. Everything was outside the processor, and you had had it had to add it as extra parts. Um, the chart, this chart here, is is the uh, assembly language, which hopefully you'll never have to deal with. But you write you write your program in a high level language like C or C plus plus or something like that, and the compiler compiles it down to assembly language and then into the code that the processor can run. Um, and these days, there's, what is it, there's 130 of those instructions. Uh, I think C doesn't have that many, I can't imagine. <laughs> this is all, this is, it's fun to learn, you don't want to write code. <coughs> those days, those days are gone. Okay. Does the, <coughs> does the Arduino IDE let you do assembly language in line? I've never tried it. I've never tried it. Yes. It, it does. does? Oh, thank you, Jeff. 
That's too bad. <laughs> well, yeah, it may be the only way to get to the counter. I don't know. I've never tried it. Uh, we'll get to that, hopefully. Um, so here's the features. The Nano has 32 kilobytes of memory, a flash memory, one kilobyte of EEPROM, two kilobytes of RAM. So the flash memory is for program storage. <coughs> the EEPROM is for non-volatile um, data storage, something you, pointers you want to keep, values when you calibrate your system you want to keep after the power is removed, you put it in there. And then the RAM is just for normal program operation. Um, it's got two 8-bit timers, um, one 16-bit timer, and you'll see it says input capture, output compare. So what you can do is with the input capture, an incoming signal can capture a count. Or an, you can create an outgoing signal with the output compare that says every time this, the counter reaches this number, toggle this bit. <coughs> So a counter, and that's just a, that's just a simplistic thing you can do with the counter. So there's there's a lot you can do, and that's why the manual's 27,000 square inches long. Um, <coughs> there's a eight channel 10 bit A to D with internal temperature measurement. There's a USART or a UART, whatever you want to call it. There's SPI, which is a four wire. Um, serial interface to talk to peripherals. And the I squared C has three different names. I believe Atmel calls it TWI, but it's I2C, IIC, and TWI. So I squared C is that's the that's the name I'm familiar with. They have watchdog timer, which is pretty cool. You you set it up so if your program doesn't do something to the timer often enough, it'll reset it. That gets you out of uh, get you out of uh, bugs. <coughs> it's got an analog comparator, kind of like the analog comparators you'd have in an op-amp circuit. Interrupts, lots of interrupts. They only have two interrupts that they deal with in Arduino code, but the pin change interrupts, you have to handle it for yourself, and those are really cool. <coughs> they, uh, well, we'll get to interrupts and all that stuff later, and then there's the programmable I.O. lines, which you can make input, output, and we'll get to that in a second also, because it's, it's more than that. <coughs> so by being more than that, here's a picture of the part, the actual IC, and I know it's hard to see from there, but there's, on most pins, there's more than one function. So of the 32 pins, there's only seven that are one function, and 25 that have shared functions, so, yeah, I gotta go here to read it. Like this, the bottom one here says, uh, PCN7, that's pin chain interrupt number seven, it's got crystal, it's got, oh, timer oscillator number two, so, you, but you can only use one of those functions at a time. Here's, here's the circuit board for the UNO. And they got all those parts on that great big board. And the only thing you're interested in is what's inside the cir red circle. This big blob on the left is the first um, USB interface they, they gave, they put on the board. And then the power supply is up on top. But the meat of the board, that little bit inside the red circle, which is the microprocessor, and then connections to the outside world. The Mega, um, same thing. They've got that large circuit on the right, which is the USB, and they've got power supplies around the outside. And <clears throat> then the meat of the board is the processor in the center that has nothing but connectors on it. And in this case, it's actually a two-page schematic. Just going to add that you can buy the 328 chip on its own and program it and not have to have the UNO surrounding it. Right. Yeah. You can. So. You get a, well. You need to have their scratch stuff. You either, need, you either need to have an Atmel programmer. Yep. Or you put a socket on an Atmel or on an Arduino board and 
file program. It in there and program it that way. And then pull it off and then, and then you can it use it, it on your project. <laughs> yeah, I, I, did, I did that because my brother and I had um, uh, an early digital hotspot, you know, for, for D-Star. And um, on that, it, it sat on a Raspberry Pi, which it was a hack for a Raspberry Pi, and it had a, a radio chip on it. And the control signals for the radio chip were done with the, the uh, 328 chip. Yeah. <clears throat> and they came out with a different firmware set for that chip so that the hotspot would also do DMR. So I bought chips with a loader on it and then just plugged them into uh, my Uno board that had a socket and that programmed the chips. The ones with the loaders on them, you can actually just put a serial USB on it if you have enough stuff to do it and program it even without the Uno yeah. board. Yeah, I already had the Uno, so... It yeah, it's a lot easier to do it that way. My point was just to bring up the fact that you can yeah. design a project just around the chip if you desire. Right, so once you get something working, you can scrap the Arduino board and just buy the chip and put your own board around it. Um, that's the Mega. So here's the Nano. And... Again, the circle is the processor and the connector. Across the bottom is the power supply. And on the right is a very simple USB interface because they used one IC that was intended to be uh, a USB interface. They didn't, the other two boards actually have a second processor being the USB interface. That's why it was so complicated. The problem here that some people run into is the chip is supposed to be an FT243, I believe the correct number is. And some companies put on a CH340, again, that's a rough guess at the number. And at least back when I had an XP machine, you had to load a special driver for to talk to that board, even though it was Arduino Nano compatible, it wasn't compatible. Um, Windows seems to have solved that problem and Windows 10 must actually have the correct driver for that off-brand chip. So, anyways, those are the, those are the schematics of the three boards. Here's a little more exploded view of the pinout and the signal designations. Um, I, 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 I get a little concerned when you see pictures like this in color. I was getting bringing on a new software engineer, and we had two big whiteboards in the conference room, and so we put all the hardware definitions on one whiteboard, all the software definitions on the other whiteboard, and they were color-coded, so you could tell what software went with what hardware. And so he let us, the team, sit there and tell him about all this stuff for about two hours, and at the end he says, um, I'm colorblind. <laughs> and I was like, Anyways, so you can see everything, everything has a meaning. Um, they do things that are very confusing. So they like, they, they label the board. As you can see down the left side of the board, it has like, starting at the bottom, D12, D11, D10, D9, etc. Those are the digital inputs. But when you're writing the code, you never put in a D12, D11, D10, D9. You put in 12, 11, 10, 9. Who knows why? Yet on the other side of the board, where they got the analog inputs, A0, 1, 2, and 3, you do use A0, 1, 2, A0, A1, A2, A3 to designate the pin. As long as you know that, works just fine. So each thing's different. The, you know, the violet numbers are digital I.O. The dark green numbers are the analog I.O. Small dark squares, uh, the small dark gray squares are actually the pin numbers of the IC. The light brown squares, or like PD1, PD0, PC6, are the port names that the processor calls them. It has nothing to do with what Arduino calls them. But, so it's a, it's a drawing like this that will take you <coughs> From, from your Arduino schematic to <coughs> the data sheet, so you can read the data sheet and translate it back to your Arduino. What is the little squiggly line like on 13, 14, 15 there? Looks like it's a fuse thing or something. 
Uh, they're all output compares of some sort. Other than that, I'm not sure what it means. You see, they're all OC, OC 2B, OC 0B, etc., etc. Is that possible pulse width output? Yes. Using the timer counters, <coughs> and you can do pulse width modulation, yeah. This is getting off track again, but they do have an analog output command in. The Arduino um, references, and what it is is pulse width modulation. It's really not analog. You have to filter that and get analog out of it. Okay, so powering the nano, there's <coughs> there's a couple things. Uh, I think my picture was as big as yours. Um, So the red circles are V in. That, that'll take up to 12 volts, I think. The blue rectangle is 3.3 volts out, not in. They're, they're giving you a 3.3 volt source to power external stuff, but it's only good to 50 milliamps. And the dark blue circles are 5 volts. And the 5 volts comes from the USB, which is how you power it when you hook it up to your computer to program it and all that stuff. But you can also then, it's a five volt pin, you can feed power back into that pin to run the board when you're not hooked up. Do you know how much current it requires? Not off the top of my head. It's less than a, um, than a pi though, right? Oh yeah. It's, it's tens of milliamps at most. That sources 50 amps or 50 milliamps. <laughs> But it won't, uh, will it sink any current? Uh, no, the 3.3 volts is only a voltage regulator output. It's, it's, <coughs> it's just, a convenience. Yeah. To. It's like, why did you put it here? Uh, where was I? Okay. Pin functions, we kind of went over that. This is just a comparison of the connectors, the schematic, the chart I showed you, and, and the IC. Um, again, simply as a reference to take you back and forth between the manual and the code and the piece of hardware. So, <coughs> that's the conclusion on the Nano. And I'll tell you why in a second. There's not much to say about the simple Arduino boards. We've just, we've just covered everything there is to know about the Arduino board. Not the microprocessor, but the Arduino board. The meat of the product is the microcontroller and the Arduino integrated development environment. And that's what the integrated development environment is what the Rara Academy session is on, is getting started programming and doing some, well, the people who have signed up have already started doing their uh, really simple exercises. And so then at the Academy, we can talk about the problems they had or questions they had, why didn't you do this, that sort of thing. Um, so. Now we'll look at the microcontroller. The first problem you have when you're using a microcontroller is the initial condition. And um, hopefully Scott will post these slides. So I'm going to try not to read the slides to um, give you the high points. So when you turn power on and the, you don't know what state the process is in because there's no program running, so you have to be aware of um, What's connected to what? So if I've got two inputs tied together, the, an input on the microcontroller and an input on an external IC, you don't want to leave that floating. You want to do something with it. You want to pull it high or pull it low. Um, and if you've got an external IC that's got a, that's a driver, so it's driving one of the pins, you have to make sure that the microcontroller can handle that. So you have to look at your initial condition and <coughs> What the little chart on the right side of the screen shows you is they actually tell you in reset, here's what the state of the pins are and the state of those registers so you know what you're dealing with during the time of reset. Then you just have to worry about how fast can I get out of reset to initializing the ports to, to work with the external hardware. 
it's not it's not as complicated as it sounds, but it's something you have to be aware of. Because all of a sudden you'll say, why is this part getting hot? And that's because you've assigned an output on the processor to drive output of another IC. And one's a one and one's a zero, and neither of them like that. Um, so that's your first problem when you're working with an IC or working with a microcontroller. And it doesn't matter that it's an Arduino board. It's got the exact same problem. <coughs> Um, one of the things that's helpful is most of the port pins have internal pull-up resistors, which you have to turn on. So that means the processor has to be running and executing code before you can turn on the pull-up resistors. So it doesn't help you during that little tiny window during reset. <coughs> okay, so digital I.O. is covered in Chapter 13 in the... Uh, um, microcontroller manual. So what, what we've got here is um, the red circles, that first red circle uh, right there, that's the pull-up resistor. And through programming a register, it turns on this FET, which pulls that resistor high and matches it got a pull-up <coughs> resistor. Um, the blue circle, that's the output. <coughs> and the green circle below that is the input and they're all tied to the same pin. So you can see, you can define it. It's one pin on the processor and it can be a digital input or a digital output. The other thing is, um, not to worry about the red square, but the, the blue and the green square down below are how the processor reads the port pin. So there's two registers to read. There's the pin register and the port register. If you read the pin register, you read the state of the pin, meaning is it high or low. If you read the port register, you read the state of the flip-flop that is driving the output pin. <coughs> so if you write, if you make this an input, so we've got an input signal and it's coming in the pin and going down through this buffer and out through this buffer here to be read in the pin register, so if that was a zero, and you, so you'd be reading a zero, and at some point, you've written a one up here on this register, because this guy is turned off, this buffer here is turned off, the one's not going out, there's a zero on there. But if you read the port register, you'll read a one. If you read the pin register, you'll read a zero, because you're reading the pin, not the port. And I'd love <coughs> to make that mistake. Because in my mind, I'm looking at the port, and they want you to think of it as two different things, the port and the pin. So the, the open, that's essentially open collector on the output then, so you could put your own pull up farther down the line if you wanted to? Um, no, you can't call it open collector because if it's an output, the, the pull up resistor isn't doing anything, it's an output, it's being, the line's being driven. As an input, it's an input, and I can put a pull up resistor on it because it's an input, not because it's open collector. Okay. Does that make sense? Kind of, I guess. Uh, so when you're using it as an output, it's always, whether you have the pull-up resistor turned on or off. Well, it won't, you can't turn the, you can set the bit to turn on the pull-up resistor, but the pull-up resistor will not be turned on. The logic doesn't allow that in, okay. the, in the part. All right. So, and the output is a push-pull output. It'll either pull it high or pull it low. Okay, so there's, there's no, tri-state on this part, or no open collector on this part, or open drain. So the pull-up resistor serves more as a terminator then for as inputs? For an inputs. Yeah, right. okay. Strictly for inputs. Uh, just more on digital I.O. Um, so, just uh, let's see. The Arduino instructions to set the pin as an input or output is this pin mode pin, pin mode instruction. And then you can do a digital read and a digital write. And although the registers in these things are eight bits long, Arduino is allowing you only to read one bit at a time through this method. Um, and so you see, you can see the registers down below on the left side. 
And then a couple examples on the right. So in, in the Ar using the Arduino functions, you'd say pin mode 8 output, which makes D8 an output. But if you were to write it in, say, in C, you'd say, well, you'd say that DDR equals 1 shifted DDB0, blah, blah, blah. And that, I can't, I can't tell you off the top of my head, but that sets, you know, I should, I just wrote all this up, but um, that's how you set the, set the bit in C. Which one means something more to you? Depends on what you're used to. I like, <coughs> I like the C version of these instructions because that's all I've, almost all I've ever used until recently. So in the C version of those, you need to know all that would be the rest of the port, right? Because you're reading port line. Right, you're going to put, you're going to set or clear one bit in an 8-bit register. And so that's what that instruction does. It says... It, it clears the rest of it, right? Um, yeah, I would think it would. You may be right, I may have put it, I may have entered it wrong. Is, is DD... I, there's no OR in there, there should have been an OR in there. Yeah. Is DDRB then a uh, memory location that goes to the register, or is that some sort of a macro, or how does no, that? No, DDRB is a register. So if you look in the bottom left, uh, well, let's call it, yeah, DDR. The okay. middle one is DDRB. So the compiler turns it into whatever machine code to write that register, not yeah. to find predefined right. value. Right, it's okay. all predefined. <clears throat> You don't have to worry about it, just use the right names. So is there any it's advantage or disadvantage between using pin mode 8 as a function versus doing it as the raw code? Is it uh, moves well, a little if faster? if I'm trying to set up four bits, I can do it with one instruction this way, or I can do it with four instructions mm -hmm. using the Arduino functions. And i got to imagine it's faster. Yeah. Because you're not going to call did, four times. Did you have a question? Oh, no, I was just going to say there... In, in C, there'd be a header file that would define yep. the physical address for all of those DDRA, DDRB. <coughs> but both of those are in C, right? It's just that the one is re directly accessing the register, the other is using a C function that's been defined right, in the H file. I was going to, I don't know, I don't think I put it in here, but we didn't really want to get into the software, but yeah, I did put in one of the, one of the C functions for one of the Arduino functions, and it's huge. Yeah, point is the first one's a library function. The second one you're actually writing to the port directly. Yeah. Oh, here's the answer. Here's the answer to one of your questions. So here's three different examples. Um, I'm going to turn on the LED. So I make the, the port <coughs> using pin mode and make it an output, and then I digital write to the port, which the 8 is the port bit, um, either a 1 or a 0. And similarly, if I wanted to read a switch, I make the, the bit, in this case, uh, bit 6, an input with a pull-up, because you need a pull-up to read a switch, otherwise there's no 1. There's only a 0, or a floating, which is worse. Um, and then just do a digital read. The complication comes, I'm sorry, we're going to... Should that be digital read 6? It probably should. <laughs> Thank you. One more thing to Debugging fix. Debugging comes later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't run the code, I just wrote it. Okay. <laughs> I, I heard that from programmers, yes. it worked for me. It compiles, <laughs> it should run. That's right. They found that in the caucus the other day. Yes. So going back to Scott's question, here's the, the, the third one is I've got a 4x4 four four keypad. And so I have to set four, four of the port bits as outputs to drive the keypad, and four of the port bits as inputs to read the keypad. And so it takes eight instructions where I can do it with two in C. But the key is it's not it's in C. You're just directly in C accessing the register as opposed to calling a library function. Yeah, but I'm sorry, Jeff. Yeah, yes, yes and no, you're right. I would really warn against the too many attempts at what's known as premature optimization because if I remember correctly, it's using LLVM, and so it's going to try to optimize this stuff for you when it, when it compiles it and turns it into a new code. Before I've claimed any speed from the code that you are comfortable writing, I would run tests 
before claiming it's anything more than the code you're comfortable with. Fair enough. So what you're saying is that pin mode may just be a macro that's doing the exact same thing. Pin mode is pin mode's a huge a, pin mode's a huge function. It's a function, it's not a macro. And it's got it addresses all the processors and all the pins. So what the LLVM compiler does is to take your code and optimize the hell out of it before making it into a Okay. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Just yours may be faster. I'm just saying. Yeah. Assume. Well, and I've always written <coughs> in C directly, except for when I wrote in assembly language. Um, but anyway, you can you can see. Old habits die hard, yeah. don't they? When you've written well, you a lot. Well, you don't know how hard Jamie's worked on me to get me to not use assembly language. Uh, I I've, I've written <laughs> millions of lines of months assembly of, language. Months of beating me with. You should be writing that in C. Anyways, um, you can you, you can see the difference in the amount of code. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh boy, put, put a bracer on that. Yeah. Okay, analog inputs. It's got some things, but um, it's there. There, it's a 10 bit A to D, which means you get results from zero to 1023. Um, it has a, a reference pin, so you can change the reference, but typically you would just use the, the five volts of your system, uh, unless you had a good reason, like um, a, a lower output sensor, like a temperature sensor, which we'll see in a minute, where you want to use a lower reference so you can get the, the thousand steps divided over maybe two volts instead of divided over five volts. Um, and the, the analog pins share functions also then, only two of them are all analog. I think A6 and 7 are analog only, but here you see that A4 and 5 are also the two-wire interface. Um, and that they also, all, all of them, except for 6 and 7, can be used as digital I.O. also. And being an analog designer, you're going to want to make sure you see the last two lines. The analog input resistance is 100 mega ohms. You can just about hang any circuit on there when the input impedance is 100 mega ohms. But be careful if you use some other processors, they're like 10,000 ohms. Mm -hmm. And so you aren't going to hang a circuit that's got a 100k voltage divider with a 10k load of the A to D converter. So it's an important spec that they put in the manual that you need to be aware of. Um, but in this particular case, it's a, it's a nice spec, 100 mega ohms. So the A to D converter works in a similar fashion. Um, the reference has um, three different types of reference. One is the default, which is the five volt power, which is the internal five volts of the IC. Then it's got, and the internal, by, by the way, the internal five volts just comes from the five volt pin on the IC. And then the internal 1.1 volt reference and then you can put some other voltage on the analog reference externally. And there's a command, the analog reference command, you can select which, which of those you want. Um, to read the channel, you just say analog read in the pin number. So A, A0, A5, whatever. And you don't have to set up digital input, digital output. It magically, take, magically takes care of it. In, so, um, so two examples. On the right, you're just reading a pot. And I showed five volts. Did I show five volts on the reference? No. So um, it's using the internal five volt reference. And you just say analog read A0. And you have a number between zero 1023, which is proportional to the voltage <coughs> on the way from the pot. On the right, we put a temperature sensor in there, which um, it's 10, what, 10 millivolts per degree C. So at room temperature, what, you're at 250 millivolts. You don't want a five volt reference. You might want to, in this case, I put a 2.5 volt reference, but you probably could have used the internal 1.1 volt reference and got an even better reading. But 
you can see how simple it is to get an analog reading. So the digital I.O. and the analog I.O. are really quite simple using um, the Arduino function. Does it default 5 volt reference if you don't set it? I believe so. Okay. It's so like your, your example on the left. Yeah, I think it did. Okay, this is just a drawing showing all the, showing a port pin with all the alternate functions, all the gating for it. You know, it's, it's there, it's, just, it's there just to show you, not, we're not going to discuss how all those things work, but you can see that one pin, there's a lot behind it. Analog comparator is pretty cool. Um, so it works just like um, an op-amp comparator, except you have a, a, a few extra features, like you can create an interrupt when, when, the, when the comparison occurs. So if you were doing something like you put uh, two and a half volts on analog M1, and you put a sine wave on analog zero um, that was centered on two and a half volts. Every time you did a crossing of the two and a half volt line, you could have it create an interrupt. And you could then take that interrupt and read a counter. And knowing how fast the counter is counting, you could subtract the two readings and calculate your frequency. Not that you're going to have to do 100 megahertz, but you could do audio. Um, communications functions, we've mentioned it on and off, but there's a USART, which is a UART with some special functions in it. Um, but it ties up D0 and D1, and it's tied up with the USB. So unless you're really into experimenting, I just stay away from using UART on the nano. I need a UART, I'll go to the mega, because it has a couple extra UARTs that aren't tied up with the USB ports. What's Serial peripheral. Peripheral interface is uh, really cool. Um, that's what you typically hook your uh, SD card to. They seem everybody seems to like to use the SPI for the SD card reading, and then the two wire interface or I squared C. Um, that's what's actually running the displays on on these projects up here. So it's a two-wire interface, but you got to throw power and ground in there no matter what. So it's not that good. But you can use the UART to read back to the computer if you want to, if you're collecting data. I've done that before. Okay. Well, I, I just I just see as far yeah. away from that as possible because I don't want to. Yep. But you can drive. You can program it with the USB, and you can turn right back around in the IDE and watch. What's coming oh, back? Oh right, you can do that. Yes, you use. So is that actually useful for debugging as yeah. well? Yeah. I'm the software guy. Yep. Okay. I'll see you then. Yeah. <laughs> so AFET, AFET timer counter. Um, without going into a huge amount of detail, it's a it's a, it's a counter. It um, has a, a clock which you can program different clock rates. <laughs> I think this one has different clock sources, and um, so like the frequency measuring we just did, you, you, once you know what the clock is, so you set it up for something that gives you a, a 100 microsecond tick, um, then when you read the difference between two zero crossings, you have a pretty good idea what the half, the halfway width of that signal is. And somebody brought up pulse width modulator. Yep, this is where you get into the pulse width modulator. And I haven't tried it, so I can't explain how it works. But it, I believe it does work somehow with the compare registers. You set two different compare registers, one the trigger high, one the trigger low. Oh, some, somebody correct me on that one. That one I'm really out in the woods on. There's a 16-bit timer counter, which is same thing, except it's 16 bit long instead of 8 bits long, so you, you get more resolution. Again, you can do the same thing, frequency counting, input capture, output compare, make a pulse width modulator. And another good use is, <coughs> that I hadn't thought of that I, I wrote it down, but I didn't think about it, is event counting. If you're trying to see how often something happens, maybe you have it hooked up to your 
garage door and you want to see how many times the kids open and close the door each day, you can have it keep track of that for you. Although there's a whole lot simpler methods than using the timer counter. But you're not satisfied at the end. <laughs> interrupts. Interrupts are interesting. What an interrupt does, if you don't know, is it stops. So you've got a program that's running in this loop. The program's running in a loop. So it just does the same thing over and over and over and over again, whatever that same thing is. And along comes an interrupt, and it jerks it off to run a little program, a little subroutine over here, and then comes back and starts back on the loop again. So you have, that's, that's, you have this, this tool, the interrupt, which is very helpful because I can stop the processor from what it's doing and tell it to go do something else within one instruction. So it completes the instruction, it's on, it goes off and executes this other subroutine you want, and then it comes back and continues running. Um, Arduino gives you some nice, <coughs> two, two nice tools to, to work with the interrupts. And, these, and there's only two of these type of interrupts that are called external interrupts. Um, but you can see the chart on the right. There's lots of interrupts. There's 26 interrupts in this, in this part. And only num number two and three are the only external interrupts, so to speak. Um, reset is an external interrupt. Right? And you have no control over that except your reset button or your power on reset or whatever. So interrupt, uh, interrupts, um, you're trying to have a lot of control. Interrupts are, are, are great for that. Ah, so here's the external interrupts, and you can see on the right the uh, Arduino functions, and they only relate to those two pins, in zero and in one. There are 23 other external interrupts that are called PCN0 through PCN23. Actually, there's no PCN15, but um, well, let's go back to the to the normal external interrupts because it's important. There's four there's there's four things that will interrupt on a low level, meaning you take the pin low and it interrupts on it. A logic change, I'm not sure what the difference between logic change and the next two functions are, which is falling edge and rising edge. So when the signal drops, you get an interrupt. When the signal rises again, you get an interrupt. That seems to be a logic change to me, but that might be a marketing thing. The logic change will trigger whether it's a rising or falling edge. Oh, oh, you're right. Maybe it does both. Maybe that's what logic change means. Good point. So, um, both, it does those four functions, and you get to select which, which of the four. Um, it's a problem with using the level. So if you pull a pin low, it goes off and does this routine, and it comes back to your main loop, and it tries to start going again, but that pin's still low, and you're on a logic low-level interrupt. So it's immediately going to go back out and execute that interrupt routine. It's going to finish. It's going to come back. It's going to start this loop, and then go right back out. And this loop. So you're stuck. So what you have to do in the interrupt routine is somehow clear that low level. And that's a design. That's an, ex that's an exercise for the student. But the interrupt routine has to somehow clear that low level. So then when the routine is finished and it comes back into the main loop, it can now run. Um, where the left or the falling edge, rising edge, it's instantaneous. You know, there's nothing to clear. It interrupted on the falling edge. It going off to the routine. Falling edge is long gone by the time you come back. So it runs normally. Which brings you to the, then to the pin change interrupts, and they only interrupt on the rising and falling edge. But you don't get to select. They interrupt on both edges. So like a Morse code key, it tells you when you close the key. Tells you when you open the key. And they aren't controlled in, with the, with the Arduino <coughs> functions. You have to manually write that code. Do you have to debounce in software then, or does that debounce logic in it? You have to debounce it. You put capacitors on there, yeah. then you don't have to deal with it. Um, internal interrupts are triggered by the actions of all those other functions inside the comparator, the UART, the timer counters. Um, and going into detail, just way more than we need to do today. Like the last line says, they're extremely useful but require studying. 
So here's a quick look at using the timer counter and pin change interrupt. So um, this, this is the here that I put in the, the ray a couple months ago. So the pin change interrupts are used to sense the opening and closing of the key in the paddle and also for the rotation of the rotary encoder. Um, and the timer is used for measuring the uh, well measuring the dot or the dash that you correct with the pad you create with the paddle. And there's also um, you can feed from a decoder a signal in to the A10 which says decoder and using the timer you can measure how long the dot or the dash is and then with, given enough of them you can figure out whether they're dots and dashes and decode them into characters to put up on the display. Um, let's see, so we use D14 and 15 for pin change interrupt that triggers a timer for dot and dash length, the 11 and 12 use pin change interrupt to decode the rotation of the rotary encoder. A11 decodes or is a pin change interrupt for the push button on the rotary encoder. A8 uses a timer for tone generation. A10, what's A10? Oh, A10 I already told you about. And then the two-wire interface is used for the LCD and the SPI is used for the SD card. So you can see we that one little schematic, or yeah, that one little circuit, you've got to try a whole lot of, whole lot of features in the chip. <coughs> If you did that as a state machine as opposed to interrupts, how, would, how much of a performance difference would you see? In other words, just sitting in your loop, checking, check, 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 come back that time. That's the way I wrote it the first time. Yeah, and the it difference? It worked just fine. Yeah. Because you're, you're in human time. The process is running so much faster than you mm -hmm. are. Yeah. So I guess you can do it that way. And that's all I got. So the information I presented tonight came from the Arduino website. That make a data sheet searching Google from Adafruit and from what I've learned. Yes, sir? I just sent you a link to some tutorials on uh, inline ASM uh, in, in case somebody wanted to add that to the Okay, I'll put it in tonight. Questions anyway? Nobody asked for very... Some people ask questions, but not very many, yes. What are the examples you have up here? What do you... Oh. Okay, the first one, you guys can come up and look at these later after we're done, and I'm all done, but I'll answer the question. The first one is, uh, I call the Morse code multi-tool, it does all kinds of things with Morse code. The second one is a direct conversion receiver. Uh, the third one is the project for the, the, on the white strip, the third one is the project for the Arduino class. The fourth one is the start of a sideband transceiver just a display, I never got any farther than that. And then the next one is the rotor, rotator controller. Um, that's gonna be part of the Arduino class if we get that far. And then the last one was one of my many prototypes for my Morse code multi-tool before I got it finished. So that's it. Anybody else? Comments, questions, thoughts to share? Yes, sir. Um, where, where, where is the uh, list of parts? Is that in the rag that, that you're recommending we get? Or Scott just put it up on the oh, website. Oh, it's on the website. Okay. But I've got a, I got a newer one. <laughs> Scott doesn't know this. I got three new ones to send them because I've updated them thanks to a few people, including Mr. Barrett in the back of the room. <laughs> um, so I can send you something tonight if I, if I remember when I get home. Anybody and the, else? Okay, and the sign-up for the classes is where? Check it out on the out table there. there. Tim's got it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, do it tonight. I'll. You know what? How many Let's slots are? How many slots are open? I, lots. I, I, I don't think yeah. we have more than eight. Okay. So, and if everybody does their work ahead of time, it'll be easy. And we've scheduled three and a half hours because the original thought was we'll go through each of the projects and talk about them. Uh, my original intent was we were going to write, do the do the building and the writing in in the room. I thought we'll never get through very much if everybody's trying to figure out how to build something on a super strip. So I sent it out two months ahead of time so people could buy what they need. They could 
run the, uh, type in the projects, run them, and then ask me questions either by email, which a couple people have, or wait till the, the class. But if I don't send you something by morning, send me an email, I'll send you the information right away. I'll try and post the stuff right away tomorrow. Well, I gotta get you new stuff. Yeah, so just send it to me, I'll get okay. it up. Anybody else? I, Oh. Question about the interrupts. The interrupt one and interrupt two are those separate pins then? Yeah, they're two separate. And they're pins. dedicated just to that? No. Nope. nope. <laughs> they're multifunction also. Okay. I think they're D three and four. All right. And they're they're also pin change interrupt pins. They just have extra interrupt functionality with yeah. the logic and rising and falling. Yep. Okay. Anybody else? Great. Thanks, guys. Thank you.